Good morning. Hope everybody had a good Labor Day. Hopefully you did something fun and exciting. Uh, I'm going to do this lecture here on Imperial America, and I'm going to go ahead and do it just because of time constraints with the class and having to get everything done that we have to do. So um, let's talk about this real quick. I won't be very long, so don't worry. And roots of expansion. How does the United States build an empire? In fact, a lot of people don't even know that America had an empire, but in a lot of ways it still does today because we've got Puerto Rico, America Samoa, Guam, the Virgin Islands, and a couple of other places there, there too. Now, the United States is going to begin to show interest in building an empire in the late 1800s, 19th century, whatever. And there are a couple of different reasons for this too. One of the biggest reasons is uh, religious leaders or... Um, also, some racist leaders here in America wanted to spread Christianity. They wanted to civilize what they considered inferior backward races or uh, the white man's burden. Um, you could also think of this in some ways as Manifest Destiny Part 2. Now that Manifest Destiny has gone to California, they want to export Manifest Destiny to other places. There's also this issue of other countries. Uh, the United States says everybody else is doing it, so why shouldn't we? This is our chance to flex our muscles. I mean, Japan has been building an empire in the late 1800s. Britain has a huge empire. Other countries like France, Belgium, and Germany are colonizing Africa. And the United, United States says, why can't we do it? You also have something called The Influence of Sea Power on History by Alfred T. Mahan. It's a book written in 1890, and it's one of the most influential books of the time period. Uh, to simplify it for you, Alfred T. Mahan, he's going to say that the more powerful your navy is, the more great your nation is. So in other words, powerful nation, powerful navy. Now, whenever you have a powerful navy, that usually means a large navy, and then you have to have naval bases all around the world. Basically, Alfred T. Mahan says the United States should build an empire more or less to have gas stations around the, the globe. Then there's a third reason, which is Republican leaders such as Teddy Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, and Secretary of State John Hay, they're actively pushing for expansion. So you have government leaders wanting this to happen. And that's a picture of Teddy Roosevelt right there, in case you're curious of what he looks like. Now we've got the beginnings of expansion. And the empire building for the United States is going to begin in the Pacific Ocean. And you have to go to the Samoan Islands. Uh, the Samoan Islands are right here. That is a map from, I think it's 1901 of what Samoa looked like. It's an island chain that's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's not really near anything else. But for whatever reason, in 1879, Germany, Great Britain, and the United States, they established this joint protectorate over the Samoan Islands. They're going to go to the Samoans and say, you need to be protected. And the Samoans say, why? Just because you do. Now, by 1889, there's a civil war in Samoa and the United States and Germany, they formally declare Samoa a colony and a territory. And American Samoa is still part of the United States today. Now, you also have to look at 1893, the islands of Hawaii. Some people don't realize this, but Hawaii used to be its own kingdom. It was an independent country. And American-born plantation owners come into... Hawaii as early as 1835. They're invited in by the king at the time. And I can't pronounce his name, so I'm not even going to try. But plantations are set up for sugar and also for pineapple. Well, by the time we get to 1888, there's a constitutional crisis. Uh, the king dies and a queen comes to power named Lily Kalani, and when Lily Kalani comes to power, she wants to try and go back to the traditional ways of the Hawaiians and get rid of some of the 
Americanizations that have happened. Well, there's a rebellion that breaks out in 1888 led by Sanford Dole. You've probably heard of the Dole Company before. Uh, Sanford Dole was a cousin of the Dole Fruit Company founder. Well, once the rebellion happens and it's successful, the American planters set up a provisional government and they ask to be annexed into the United States in 1893. Well, that's not going to happen until 1898 until after something else happens. So you actually have... American planters in charge of a provisional Hawaiian government for about six years before it becomes part of America. And right here, that is a map of Hawaii for you. All right, trouble in Cuba. A big part of American um, building happens in Cuba, American um, imperialist movement. And what happens is in 1895, Cuba was still a colony of Spain. It was the last colony of Spain. And in 1895, Cubans revolt against Spanish rule. Well, the Spanish military was led by this guy named Valeriano Whaler, or Valer. And the Spanish government orders him to put down the rebellion. And he uses super harsh methods, lots of death, lots of uh, destruction. And over 200,000 Cubans die in this rebellion. Now, how does that involve the United States? Well, it's because during the late 19th century, U.S. businesses invested heavily in Cuba. And we're talking 90% of all sugar plantations are owned by U.S. businesses. Sugar plantations are the number one industry and the number one employer on the island. And owners, they didn't want to see the revolution destroy everything that they had built. So that's where this idea of yellow journalism comes in. Yellow journalism, it's like sensationalism. And you can see the bottom picture there, that's a screen grab or screenshot from the New York Journal, which was a newspaper written or edited by William Randolph Hearst. There's also another article, not article, but there's another newspaper called The World that's made by Joseph Pulitzer. Now, both of these newspapers, they would publish stories that were sensationalized, fictional, or just over the top. It's like a combination of tabloid newspapers and just those fake newspapers you see that talk about Bat Boy being found in a cave. Now, what these yellow journalistic newspapers do is they talk up and they sensationalize what's going on in, in Cuba to the point that America wants to go to war against Spain to avenge the Cubans and punish Spain and everything else. And the top picture, that's a political picture. Uh, it's got Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst uh, trying to basically build a war. And they they have two different ways to do it. Well, they, the yellow journalists, they get some really big help on February 15th, 1898. A U.S. battleship called the USS Maine sails into Havana Harbor in Cuba, and it blows up. 226 sailors are killed. Who's blamed? Spain. And U.S. newspapers, specifically the journal in the world, start to point their fingers at Spain blame Spain, and this, this idea of we have to go to war, we have to avenge, comes into being. This idea of remember the main. Now, really what happened is the gunpowder magazine in the front of the ship exploded uh, because of poor ventilation, but it was thought that Spain had purposely blown up the ship, and nobody knew that wasn't true at the time. So we've got the Spanish-American War, and I'm sorry there's so much on this, but I gotta get it all done really quickly. On April 11th, 1898, President William McKinley is going to ask Congress to declare war against Spain. And Congress says yes with a couple of rules. Number one, we must recognize Cuba is independent. 
And number two, they passed the Teller Amendment, which was an amendment to the war declaration that said the United States has no desire whatsoever to control Cuba. Uh, we don't want Cuba. We're not going to take Cuba. Now, we'll see how that works out. The war lasts a total of three months. It starts on May 1st. The U.S. Navy sails into Manila Bay, which is in the Philippines, opposite side of the world from Cuba. And the American Navy is going to attack the Spanish Navy in the Philippines. One American sailor is killed while the U.S. Navy destroys or captures 10 Spanish ships. Now, the United States is going to occupy the city of Manila, which was the capital of the Philippines, in early August. <clears throat> now, this whole war is supposed to be about Cuba, and eventually we do get to Cuba, and on July 1st, the U.S. troops are going to overrun Spanish positions on the island of Cuba. On July 3rd, the Spanish Navy is going to try and sail out of Cuba, but they can't because the American Navy is blockading the Cuban island. And Spanish control over Cuba and really the last colony of Spain in America falls by the end of July. By the time the Spanish-American War is over, there are 5,000 American deaths, but less than 400 of them are because of combat. The other 4,600 or so were because of disease, a malaria and yellow fever. Now, the Spanish-American War ends with the Treaty of Paris, 1898. And I always tell my classes, whenever you're talking about a Treaty of Paris, you have to include the year, because I can think of three Treaty of Parisises off the top of my head right now. So this is the Treaty of Paris, 1898. And it's pretty short. Spain recognizes the independence of Cuba. Spain gives the United States official control over the Philippines. The United States gets Puerto Rico, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And as a token of friendship, if you will, the United States gives Spain $20 million for their trouble. Now, I mentioned that the Teller Amendment said that the United States had no desire to stay in Cuba. Well, just kidding about that. The United States stays in Cuba. Uh, 1901, the Platt Amendment is passed. That basically said America will withdraw from Cuba only if Cuba agrees that America can come back whenever it wants. That's kind of like selling your house, but the previous owner says, I can come back and raid your kitchen whenever I want to. Sounds a little weird. Uh, the other thing that happens is the United States is forced to or the United States forces Cuba to give them a lease on land at Guantanamo Bay. The lease was originally supposed to end in 1999, but, well, that didn't happen because of communism. And now the United States still has Guantanamo Bay in 2020. Now, this amendment, it will stay in effect all the way up until 1934. And the United States actually... Um, intervenes and reoccupies Cuba twice. It does it once in 1906 and stays there until 1909. And then the United States also occupies Cuba again in 1912. Now the United States and Cuba will stay very close friends all the way up until the 1950s, 1960s. In fact, Cuba used to be where a lot of people went just for uh, vacations. And Cubans would very often just get on a plane, go to Miami, shop, and then go back home, just like we go to the mall today. Also, U.S. investments in Cuba grow to $500 million in 1920 by 1920, which is something like $3 billion today. So the United States is very, very heavily invested in Cuba. Now, back to the Pacific Ocean. we got to talk about this. Uh, the problem with the Philippines does not end with the Spanish-American War. Uh, the Filipinos don't really want America there, and a guerrilla war breaks out. This guerrilla war lasts four years. It's led by a guy named Emilio Aguinaldo. And fighting happens throughout the Philippines. And when the war ends, the U.S. has lost about 4,000 men, 
while the Filipinos have lost a minimum of 10,000. And if you count civilian losses, um, the, the people of the Philippines suffered 50,000 casualties. And then the United States will remain in the Philippines till after World War II. The Philippines get their independence from the United States on July 4th of 1946. We also have to deal with China at this time. Uh, there's something called the Boxer Rebellion that starts in 1899 and goes into the year 1900. Um, I won't get into too many details because it's more of a world history thing. But what you need to know is that in 1899, there's this group of revolutionaries called the Righteous and Harmonious Fists, also the Boxers. They attempt to throw out all foreign powers from China. Uh, they rebel against the the government. They kill thousands of foreigners. They kill thousands of Chinese who are friendly to Western powers. They kill thousands of Christians. Uh, they occupy the city of Beijing and they burn down the foreign district of the city. They take hostages, everything. Well, in the year 1900, there's this international army that includes 2,500 Marines. They're going to invade China, defeat the boxers, rescue the Europeans, and then take over the capital city of Beijing. Now, at the same time all this is going, there's this idea called spheres of influence. Basically, Russia, Germany, France, Japan, and Britain, they're all carving out territory in China. They're not setting up colonies, per se, but there are certain parts of China that can only do business with certain countries. The U.S. Secretary of State named John Jay, he doesn't like this. He wants all the trading ports and he wants the Chinese government to be open to American business. And so he's going to pass something called these open door notes that says keep China open for everybody to do business. Now, because of these open door notes and because of the United States showing its influence in China, uh, China is able to maintain its independence after the uh, Boxer Rebellion. But it barely maintains its independence. China is a much, much weaker country after this war happens. Now there are some other issues that we have to look at real quick, and this is the last of the slides. Uh, before I give you this last slide though, I do need to do one of these secret word quizzes just so that I know you watched it. Um, and today's secret word, we will make it uh, flash drive. And that's a weird one, but I have like a handful of flash drives in front of me right now. So your secret word for today will be flash drive. I'm sure you all have some of those. So flash drive, secret word. Okay, other issues. In 1899, there's this group called the Anti-Imperialist League. It's set up by uh, people like William Jennings Bryan, James, or I'm sorry, Jane Adams, Mark Twain, some very big names in the country get together and they argue that this idea of imperialism, this idea of forcing U.S. rule on other people, uh, it violates the Declaration of Independence and it violates American ideals. So you have this group that's going to argue against and fight against American imperialism. But it doesn't work. The Panama Canal becomes American territory in 1903. And you can read what happens there, but I'll tell you the short story. Um, in 1901, uh, the Columbia, which used to be, um, Panama used to be part of Columbia. Uh, Columbia and the United States, they make an agreement to allow America to take over the, the canal zone. Uh, the Colombian Senate says no, refuses to ratify the treaty. President Roosevelt gets angry and encourages and assists Panama in uprising and declaring independence against Panama. Well, once Panama wins independence, the United States 
immediately declares Panama an independent country, and Panama gives the United States territory. The United States is going to maintain that territory up until I think like 2000 or 2001. It's very recent that we give it up. And then the United States is going to build the Panama Canal. Then last but not least, we have something called the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, and that says the United States has the right to intervene in Latin American countries to keep order and see that foreign debts are paid. In other words, President Teddy Roosevelt is going to declare the United States the policeman of the New World. And it's going to say that European countries can stay out. Now overall, um, a lot of Latin American countries dislike the United States because of this and because of the Panama Canal. And the United States has been active in a lot of Latin American countries since the Roosevelt Corollary was given out. Uh, the United States has intervened in the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Haiti, Mexico, um, and several other places, Grenada, uh, you name it. And the United States has been involved here in Latin America after the Roosevelt Corollary was passed. All right, 22 minutes. That's it. Don't forget to answer the secret word quiz. And don't forget to do all your work for this week. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.